taking a look at the, uh, at the political history of uh, Chicanos here, uh, I've broken it down in my own mind into three different stages, and I'll describe each one of these uh, briefly. Um, bring it up, I'll be bringing it up to the 1960s, which I think is a period that's very relevant to the discussion that we've had up to now uh, here at the conference. The, uh, the first stage that I've been able to see uh, that's clearly marked as a stage is during the second half of the 19th century. And we don't have very good information for most of that time, let's say 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. The period when we start to get a little better information is during the 1890s. But one thing that seems very clear is that during that time period, during the 19th century, Chicanos throughout the Southwest were very much on the defensive. And the response that people were making at that point was to try to conserve what they had had before the United States takeover in 1848. And they were trying to conserve the land, which was slowly being taken away during that time period. They were trying to conserve their political status, which was slowly being eroded. And they were trying to conserve even the very existence of their communities, because as the land was taken away, uh, as the political status uh, sank, uh, as people lost whatever economic positions they had, uh, the very existence of the community started to come into question. So the tactics uh, and the ideology that people developed at that time was basically defensive, and in a way you might say conservative, in the sense that they were trying to conserve uh, as much as they could of what had existed before, even though we don't think of some of these people as conservative. For example, the social bandits that um, uh, Luis was uh, talking about uh, yesterday, Tiburcio Vasquez and others, uh, the ones who really were social bandits, and there were quite a number in, in Texas as well as here in California. Uh, there was a, uh, a relatively full-fledged insurrection that took place in Texas also during this time period, uh, led by Cortina. That was one kind of response that people made at one level to that loss of status and that loss of the land. At another level, pretty much at the elite level, and I think it's very important to keep in mind that there was a Chicano elite during this time, just as there is now. The response of the elite, who basically had their, b their base of economic growth in the land, uh, was to go into electoral politics. And electoral politics here is something that Chicanos have been involved in for a long time. Uh, the Californios you know, here, uh, the people in, in uh, Nuevo Mexico were probably the people that were the most successful because they had the biggest population base. Uh, but, but even they tended to lose status over time. One of the most interesting groups during this time was Las Guerras Blancas, uh, a group of masked uh, Chicano writers uh, in northern uh, Nuevo Mexico who wrote particularly around 1890, 1891, and who actually published a uh, political platform uh, in defense of the rights of poor people there. So those are some of the kinds of responses that people had. but. Coming out of this time period, if you look at the Southwest as a whole, the organizations that I think are the most significant and the most important are the ones that are called the Mutualistas, or the, the Mutualistas, or the Mutual Aid Societies. And uh, in particular, we have a couple of studies that have been done of one called the Alianza Hispano-Americana, which was founded in Tucson in uh, 1894, and which reached its high point in the uh, 1930s and continued in existence until uh, the 1960s. Uh, there are other mutual aid societies that are still in existence today. These groups here tended to focus around things such as providing uh, low-cost uh, uh, death benefits. Am I getting some booming on that? Or going down again? Okay. Um, they tended to focus around providing a kind of an early kind of life insurance for Chicanos who could not get life insurance any other way. And, but they tended to branch out from there into sponsoring social activities, um, fiestas, uh, parties, uh, things of this kind. And some of them went into things like providing educational and health services as well, although that was not a very important part. But this group, the Alianza Hispano-Americana and the other uh, mutual aid societies also, put a very heavy stress on the Mexican heritage. And they were very Mexicano-oriented. All of their proceedings tended to take place in Spanish, 
and the, the, their heroes, their rituals, uh, all of their proceedings tended to uh, stress the Mexican heritage as a very integral part. So they were, in that sense, nationalistic organizations. And the way I see these organizations uh, is that they were basically concerned with preserving the existence of the communities at that time, not only the communities in terms of the buildings and the barrios and so forth, but the buildings in terms of the patterns of social interaction that people had. You know, that people could get together, that they knew who they were, that they could support each other, all of those kind of things. When we talk about a community, you know, in a real sense, these were the things that this group was trying to hold on. And so, you know, one of the, if we, if we look at the long pattern historically, what I, what I have done is identify that as being one of the major goals of Chicano political and community organizations, and I've called it community, because that's essentially what it revolved around, trying to maintain that identity, you know, the collective identity, trying to maintain the existence of the communities over time. And that was very much their main emphasis. Okay, the second stage of Chicano political, of the history of Chicano political ideology here was a period that you could place as roughly from the 1920s to the 1960s, or to the 1950s, rather. And this is a period where the emphasis shifted a great deal from the earlier period. What the organizations that grew up during this time tended to become more overtly political as time went on, all during this time period, from the 1920s to the 1950s, the organizations became more and more political. At the same time, they tended to become more and more specialized. And it wasn't really until the 1950s that you had groups that were specifically political, like MAPA, for example, here in California, or PASO. Uh, in uh, Texas. Now these, these groups that developed during this 30-year period here, rather than putting their heavy emphasis on community and the existence of community and the preservation of community, tended to put their emphasis on inequality. And that's the second one of the major goals that I've been able to identify in looking at this political history. Okay, this was their heavy stress on inequality. There was, for example, a lot of effort that these groups put out in terms of breaking down the patterns of segregated schools. You know, that, was, that was a major emphasis of all the organizations that existed during this time, trying to break down segregation in the schools. Uh, you know, some of us uh, here in the audience that perhaps a little older had the experience of going to segregated schools. I went to a segregated school myself uh, uh, at the elementary level in, in uh, South Texas, and that was pretty much a universal experience, you know, back. In the old days, of course, many schools are still uh, segregated, but not in quite the same way as they used to be. Uh, these organizations put a great deal of emphasis on breaking down discrimination in the legal system. As you know, there were a lot of uh, lynchings, a lot of poli police abuses. If you go back and you look at some of these documents, one of the things that's so striking is just how contemporary they seem. You know that Chicanos were getting together and they were protesting very much the same kind of poli police abuses, abuses of the court system, et cetera, et cetera, that people are doing now. That has hardly changed at all uh, from the earliest records that we have. Uh, likewise, people were trying to break down inequality in the political system. They were attacking gerrymandering, they were attacking poll taxes, liter literacy taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of course, they were trying to break down discrimination in the economic system, uh, the notorious system of the dual wage dual wages, for example, paying Chicanos one uh, kind of wage and paying Anglos a different kind of wage. That was almost universal in the Southwest. It was universal for a long time. So some of the groups that developed during this time were groups like, um, uh, there was a group called OSA, uh, Order Sons of America. Uh, the LULACs, who are, are of course still around and claim to be the largest Chicano political organization at this time, originated uh, during the 1920s, during the late 1920s the League of United Latin American Citizens. Uh, those were the first two important groups that arose during this period. Later on, during the 1940s, you had the GI Forum uh, coming into existence, and here in, in uh, California, the CSO, the Community Services Organization. Uh, later on, in the 1950s, you had MAPA, you had PASO. So these were like some of the main organizations during that time period. But when the, when the OSO, the OSA and the LULACs originated in the 1920s, you know, like I say, their emphasis wound up being very different. Rather than putting their emphasis on community, they put their emphasis on inequality and on struggling around inequality. They also tended to play down their 
their uh, Mexican nationality very much, uh, uh, particularly in the early stages. Uh, in the 1920s and the 1930s, there was a very heavy stress on Americanism and assimilation, and there were no bones about it. The OSA and the LULACs both restricted their membership to American citizens. Uh, they conducted their meetings in English uh, rather than Spanish, like the Mutualistas did. Uh, and they, they insisted uh, that people who were affiliated with them uh, learn English and stress English and that they bring their children up uh, within that kind of tradition. And these organizations also were relatively middle class in their orientation. That is, the people that organized them, that formed them, were predominantly middle class. And it's very important to keep in mind, and I, I want to stress this because I haven't seen it stressed very much in this conference so far. You know, I wanted to stress that Chicanos are a multi-class group within the society. We have been a multi-class society all during the time, uh, all during the 19th century and the 20th century, and of course before then, under the Mexican period and the Spanish period. And when you analyze these political groups, and you see their ideologies, and you see what kind of things they stress, you have to take their class standing and their class origin very much into account. Groups like the OSA and the LULACs, for example, they came into existence during the 1920s when there were large waves of, of Mexican immigrants uh, coming into the United States. In fact, the largest waves of Mexican immigrants up to that time, even greater than the 1910s, was during the 1920s. People who had any kind of foothold in the society up to that time, any kind of standing at all, I mean, you know, they might have some little Pasquachi business in the barrio side of town, but nevertheless, within their particular communities, they were the middle class, and they identified themselves as such. They were very concerned that the new waves of immigrantes coming in from Mexico were going to swamp them, in a sense, and pull them down. Uh, destroy the very little economic base that they had been able to hold on to during that time. And that's one of the reasons that they were very much at pains to separate themselves from that group, to say, well, you know, we are not Mexicanos, we are Americans. We speak English, we stress citizenship, uh, we incorporate into our rituals and so forth American symbols rather than Mexican symbols and so forth and so on. And they were very concerned that, that Anglos in the society would, sim would not make any distinction that they would say, well, you know, they're all Mexicans, which is what they tended to do, of course, and then they were afraid that that would lead to downward mobility on their part. So that was part of the dynamic that was going on there, one of the reasons why they did not stress community, you know, and identity, at least in any kind of distinctive sense, and they tended to stress instead these different conflicts about equality. Okay, so that was the second stage. The third stage and of course, you know, I'm, I'm sort of oversimplifying and skipping over a number of developments during that time just uh, because of the, of the time limitation. Uh, yeah, uh-huh. Okay, the third stage uh, developed during the 1960s. And, you know, we could argue that we're still in that stage now, or we could argue that maybe we're starting to go into a different stage. I'm not clear about that myself. But at any rate, it seems very clear that in the 1960s you had a third stage develop with the Chicano movement. And what I see, you know, looking at it in a historical perspective, what I see as being really important and different about the 1960s from the previous periods is that you had a revival of interest in community at that time. In, in that sense, it seems like the movimiento of the 1960s kind of harkened back you know, to the 1910s and the 1900s and the 1890s and sort of skipped over and in many cases reacted against what had gone on in the period from the 1920s to the 1950s. So there was a revival of interest in the community and in identity and all of the, the, the control over community institutions, control over our own cultural process, you know, a theme that has come up again and again in this conference. And the reason for that, you know, I think is, is very clear. That's that the 1960s was a kind of a mobilizing period where many of the people who are here, you know, myself included, many of the, of the artists who are here and so forth, were people who either began their work at that time or who were already working but whose ideology and consciousness was transformed during that time so that their work tended to take on uh, a different orientation and a different kind of tone. But the other distinctive thing during this time period is that I think for the first time in the political history of Chicanos, you had the two major goals, community on the one hand and equality on the other hand, being 
equally treated, or in other words, they were both very important for the movements of the 1960s. And when we talk about those movements, you know, I think most of us are familiar, at least to some extent, with those organizations. The Brown Berets were one of the first of those organizations starting here in California. Mayo was one of the first student organizations starting in Texas. All during this history, you see a kind of interplay, by the way, with Texas, California, you know, being like the main sources of, of development of these, uh, of these different organizations. Uh, the Plan de Aslan, of course, which uh, was proclaimed in uh, 1969, uh, coming out of the whole, the Denver Youth, Youth Conferences, uh, the Crusade for Justice in Denver, was very much a kind of a catalyst uh, for that whole movimiento, for things that had already begun before, you know, a few years before, but did not really reach a kind of a, an apex until that time. Uh, there are people here who are very much involved uh, in that who may even have attended those conferences. Uh, and in the Plan de Aslan and in the Denver Youth Conferences, the, uh, I think that was a place where the, the wedding was really made here between these two major political goals, between the community and the equality. Uh, the focus was very strong on culture, on nationalism, on the development of a Chicano independent party. But uh, another interesting aspect of this whole thing here is that while there was, in a certain sense, a kind of a going back to the earlier period in terms of the emphasis on community, the context was very different in the 1960s. That is, the Chicano communities themselves had changed very much in the 1960s from the way they had existed in the 1910s and the 1900s. And as a result, the tone and the cultural references that came out of this tended to be very different also. So that, for example, if you go back and you take a look at the kind of things that the mutualistas tended to stress, and uh, like there was a major congreso that took place in 1911 called the Primer Congreso Mexicanista. Uh, you take a look at the kind of symbols that they stressed and the kind of, uh, uh, yeah, basically the kind of symbols that they used, they were essentially relatively contemporary Mexican symbols. They tended to relate to, to Benito, Ju to, you know, to, they related to Hidalgo, they related to Juarez. Uh, to that kind of thing. Their proceedings were all in Spanish. Uh, there was that kind of a tone which was very much a kind of a connection with the recent Mexican past and the Mexican present at that time. If you take a look at the symbols coming out, out of the 1960s and out of the Crusade for Justice on the Plan de Aztlán, you see something very different. You see a going back to the Aztecs. You know, that's, that's where that symbology started. Uh, it's out of those Denver Youth Conferences and out of the Plan de Aztlán. Now, rather than going back to Hidalgo and to Juarez and to the 19th century kind of experience, people were looking much further back, you know, beyond that. And in a sense, you know, what people have tended to do is stress the positive side of that and saying, well, we're rediscovering our Indian heritage and so forth, which is true. At the same time, you also have to take into account that, that there was a kind of a romantic or mystical, a kind of an unreal feel to a certain extent about the use of that symbology which had not existed in the earlier period. It is in the earlier period, it was very natural for people to relate to Juarez and to Hidalgo and to the other cultural symbols that were used at that time. It was something everyone was familiar with in those communities. It was a very natural kind of reference. Corky Gonzalez, on the other hand, in developing the references to the old Indian past, essentially pulled them out of the history books. You know, he, in a sense, sort of in reinvented them, recreated them, reinterpreted them and brought them back to life again in a sense, but in a very different way and in a very different context. And so whereas during this time period you see this heavy emphasis on community again, you know, the emphasis on community is in a very different kind of context. And for that reason, I think the kind of symbols that people used in bringing the community forward again tended to be very different kind of symbols. And of course, we see the reflections of that here in virtually all of the slide presentations that were made here at the conference, and you see the reflections of those symbols coming out of the uh, out of the late 1960s and early 1970s. You know, now of course some of them are being transformed and so forth, but nevertheless their presence is very much there. Uh, so you know, uh, a little later then you had the Plan de Santa Barbara come out. You had Mecha uh, here in California. You had La Raza Unida Party, which of course, I mean, in my mind that was kind of like the prototypical. Uh, a movement, a uh, Chicano movement organization of the 1960s and 1970s. When La Raza Unida declined, in a sense, the whole Chicano movement 
kind of decline. So that's what I see, you know, as being like the three major stages that have gone through up to now. And people, you know, in terms of ideology, in terms of how people define their goals, and we might want to discuss whether, in fact, we're still in that third stage, whether, in fact, we're passing into a different stage or whatever. It's usually very difficult to tell when you're right on top of a particular development uh, what's happening, and it isn't until later that you get some kind of perspective and you're able to see what is happening. Now, I, I want to make, you know, one more point um, here um, about these two goals. Uh, and it's a point that it has been in my mind for a long time that I've, in a sense, been trying to articulate for some time, but haven't really done so yet. And that's that it seems to me that the way that political organizations and community organizations have gone about defining these goals and working on these goals and trying to achieve them winds up creating a certain contradiction. And that contradiction is usually not very clearly recognized by Chicanos. Uh, okay, I come out of basically a social science orientation, but I talk a lot to historians as well. And I know from you know, that context that social scientists and historians, Chicanos social scientists and historians for the most part, have not dealt with this contradiction. In observing the presentations that were given here, one of the things that I was very interested in doing was seeing to what extent artists and other creative people, poets, and so forth, had dealt uh, with this contradiction to see whether you had been any more successful in dealing with this you know, than we had been. And I, I didn't really see it here either. This is a contradiction that I see. Typically, the way that people have tried to achieve equality you know, over the last 40 or 50 years, once that became an important goal, once people started to make the comparison between Chicanos and Anglos and said, well, you know, we should be getting the same treatment that they are, and if we're not, there's something wrong and we're going to do something about it. Once people started to do that, <laughs> they, they started to break down certain kinds of barriers. They started to break down these educational barriers that I talked about. They started to break down residential barriers. They, they moved against people and practices that were restricting Chicanos to the barrio. They, they tried to break down barriers, uh, economic barriers, political barriers, all kinds of barriers, and in a sense, the effect that that has to the extent that it's successful is to move Chicanos into the existing structures of the dominant society. I mean, to the extent that you're not going to a segregated school, what you're obviously doing is going to an integrated school. To the extent that you're not restricted to a particular kind of low-paid manual labor job, then you're moving into a skilled worker job, as Chicanos have done very successfully in the last 30 years. Uh, to the extent that you're no longer restricted to barrio politics, then you're entering into mainstream politics. So all of this has been like an attempt to move into the dominant structures in the society, and it has been successful up to a certain point, and I'm sure you have your own kind of parallels within uh, you know, the world of, of art and other kind of creative uh, work. Now, to the extent that that has tended to happen, the unintended consequence of that, and I don't think anyone, except maybe for the early Lulax, you know, really intended for this to happen, but the unintended consequence of that is that that has tended to make it less and less possible to achieve the other goal, the goal of community, the goal of identity. Uh, because to the extent that that Chicanos wind up moving into the dominant structures, they tend to take on the culture, the coloration, the way of behaving, uh, the language, everything, essentially, about that dominant culture. And I think everyone knows, at least at an intuitive level, and maybe from their own personal experience, that once Chicanos start to move up economically, once you start to move into better paying jobs, the tendency is to move out of the barrio and to move into another part of town where Chicanos are not concentrated. And the tendency, then, is for English to displace Spanish. And very often, it's not so much in the generation that's made the move, but in the next generation, and of course, even more than in the generation after that. Uh, so all during the, uh, I mean, every area that you look at, whether it's language, uh, whether it's kind of, uh, you know, cultural reference uh, that we have, or everything else, to the extent that we're successful in breaking down those barriers, uh, we wind up, in fact, undermining, and those barriers have been, in a way, kind of like di uh, dikes, you know, or dams, which in a way have allowed the community to exist and to maintain a separate existence. That's the other side of the coin. You know, the negative side of it, of course, is the inequality, the oppression, the exploitation that we all know about. But the other side of that coin is that it's allowed those communities to carry on a separate existence and maintain 
a separate identity over time. So that's the paradox and the irony, you know, of it to me, is that to the extent that we manage to achieve, to achieve equality or to overcome inequality and to break down those barriers, which is the first priority, and usually that's the case in those two goals, that is the, the first priority, we wind up undermining, you know, the possibilities of achieving the second goal. And a lot of that works its, its way out over two or three generations, so it's not always apparent that that's what's happening to people at one historical point in time. But when you stand back, you know, and you look at the long view, uh, then you see that, that happening. Uh, now, the conclusion that I draw from that, and it's not a conclusion that everybody agrees with, the conclusion that I draw from that is that that is a dilemma, and that it's a dilemma that arises because of the existing structure that we find ourselves in. That is, a society is set up in such a way that it poses that as a dilemma to us. I don't think it's a dilemma that's built into human existence, you might say. It's not a dilemma that's built into any kind of society or any kind of social structure that we could invent or devise. It is rather a product of this particular social structure that we happen to live in. It, the social structure is like a cage, you know, I see it, that, that we're imprisoned in. Within that cage, we only have two options. If we were to talk about other options, if we said we do not want to have to choose either community or equality, but we wanted, in fact, to have both, then we would have to talk about changing that structure. You know, and one of the interesting conversations that I had yesterday was with Judy Vaca, we were, uh, you know, uh, talking about the, the Great Wall of L.A. and what has happened there, and that has very much a historical dimension, a historical perspective to it. In the conversation last night, you were saying that uh, one of the things that you were doing is in creating the wall there is to project the future on that wall. A very ambitious, you know, undertaking. At first, you know, I thought that maybe there was like some kind of crystal ball methodology, you know, that could be used here in order to project the future. But then in talking to you further, I realized that you were talking about projecting the future not as we think it will exist, but the future as we would like to see it happen. Okay, so in order to do that, we need a vision, you know, and I mean, maybe it's very appropriate in talking to a collection of people who deal with the visual arts, you know, to talk about the creation of, of that alternative vision, because I don't see that vision myself. I don't see it coming out of the works of the 1960s or the political movements out of the 1960s. What we tended to stress there was what we did not like in the existing system. When we talked about what we wanted, that it was in very vague terms, aside from equality and so forth, in very vague terms. No one ever sat down to spell out what that society would look like. What would the economic system look like? What would the political system look like? What would the social system look like? What are we really talking about, you know, in terms of an alternative vision? And my feeling is that that's unfinished work of the movement, you know, and that's work, if that's going to be done, and I think it needs to be done in order to advance to another stage of struggle, then it has to be done in a cooperative kind of way. It has to be done by people who are artists because artists have certain talents for seeing things that do not yet exist and bringing them into being. Historians have other kinds of talents. They tend not to do that. They look at the past rather than at the future. But they have certain kinds of skills in terms of analysis and in terms of seeing what kind of problems people had before that could be avoided in the future. I think you know one of the challenges is to be able to bring together all of these different kinds of talents and combine it in such a way, and I don't know exactly how, but to combine them in such a way as to come up with some kind of a vision that can be a guide, you know, to our future political work. Okay, I'll stop.